excited um, to have an old friend of certs, um, Chanel Montana, who is also an entrepreneur, a co-owner of Denord Craft Spirits, which is, I don't know, like six blocks of the crow flies that way from my house where I am right now. <laughs> it's not very far. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're really happy to have you um, to share your story and to talk about small business and the opportunities and challenges with a small business for doing clean energy. And you come from your, your work is in the renewable energy realm. And so you're not a stranger to clean energy. And, um, and then you started a business. And, um, you know, I, I guess the first question I'll ask you is when you opened your distillery, did you have some goals around clean energy, efficiency, renewables, whether it was within the building or the process, because um, it's a distillery, in case I didn't say that. Um, and welcome when I launched this first question. <laughs> Thank you, Diana, and thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have, I've been to many sorts of events in the past, um, and I wear two hats, like Diana said. I wear my sort of clean energy hat, and I wear my Denord Craft Spirits hat. Um, and today, I'm going to mix those worlds a little bit. Um, but not too much. And yeah, thank you for that. You know, when we started, I think our main goal was to not just start a distillery, but also we were firm, my husband and I are co-owners of, of the distillery and we were firm believers that business can have a positive impact in the community. Um, whether you're making a widget or brewing beer, or in our case, making whiskey, um, we just really believe that business has this positive role to play. And so we were looking at sustainability within our business and you know being socially conscious as just part of who we wanted to be as a business full stop um, when it relates to clean energy and energy efficiency we saw that a lot of small distilleries were really struggling with how to be energy efficient and we struggled with it as well and so you know i think you know one of the, the things that you're going to hear over at least the time that, that i'm um, speaking is that we had all these lofty goals and some we realized just weren't possible some we realized we didn't have the funds for and some we realized we could really do and sink our teeth in and i think that's where you know organizations like certs really come in to help businesses like ours small big medium um, be able to utilize all these programs and and really um, know what's available to them to be sustainable well, and so you talked about some of them were harder to do. So, well, like, what are some of those challenges um, for a small business to incorporate those measures? I mean, probably, obviously, money. You mentioned that already. But what are some of the other challenges? Yeah, so money is a huge one. You know, when we started on at Denord in 2013, my husband and I both had other jobs we were doing. He was just getting out of law school. And, um, you know, we started on a very shoestring budget, particularly when you look at how other distilleries um, typically come in with multiple investors. And we wanted to keep it within our family. That was, that was important to us to regain that control. Um, and because of that, you know, one, a couple of examples that we really ran into is you know, a lot of stills. If you think of the distilling process, right, you're heating something up, you're vaporizing something, it goes through the still, but then it has to cool down. And we, could have purchased a, what was called a chiller. That chiller was half of our entire business budget. And so we had to be creative, like, hey, well, how do we chill our project product? And what most distilleries do when they start, including us, is they do it with water. And um, that water, we suddenly had to start thinking, okay, well, we're using all this water to chill our product. What can we then do with it? Can we store some of it? Can we reuse some of it? Can we put it back through some sort of cycle? Sometimes we were successful in that. A lot of times we weren't. But from our standpoint, it was either we do this or we don't, we don't have the ability to create our product. Another example that I would say is, you know, when we were starting, it's, you know, now we're looking at buying buildings, we're looking at doing a lot of great things. But when we started, we were tenants and we still are um, tenants in part of our facility. And something like solar seems really unattainable. And I, I work in the solar industry and I was like, I'm sure there's a way, there must be something I'm not catching on to here, right? And, you know, I, I talked to all of my friends in the industry and the general consensus was for small businesses like ours that are either starting or only have a couple of years, you don't have the financial track record to do a community solar garden. 
you may have the loftiest goals, but if you don't have the money to put up front and the space to put your panels on, what is probably your rented building, there isn't a great way for you to interact with that industry. So, you know, I did all the troubleshooting I could and, and realized until we were able to buy our building and have that control and make that investment, this probably wasn't going to be something that we could do um, fairly easily and in the way that we wanted to. So, you know, now we are looking at, uh, the, the third one I would say is in your actual building as a tenant. Um, the, the other problem that we came into is, okay, we were a manufacturing tenant and if we upgraded a building and spent that capital, if we spent $20,000 on an energy efficiency upgrade, when we left that building, that energy efficiency upgrade and that $20,000 stayed there, but we would go somewhere else. And so it was very difficult for us to financially justify some of the improvements that we wanted to do. Um, so those were the three examples that I would use that are the most crystal clear. So thank you. That's really great. I mean, so um, those that, you know, that's jumping into kind of also the elements of, you know, um, the building and process that relate to clean energy. Those are really great examples. And you're right. I think um, with small businesses, that is a huge challenge. Many small businesses, and I know along Lake Street and Matt will talk about this, are, are tenants. And um, that makes it really difficult because you don't have the ability to recoup necessarily that investment that you make. So that makes it really, really difficult. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, your facility is, I don't know, 100 yards, 200 yards, I'm not sure, from the third precinct where a lot of um, uh, the civil unrest after the killing of George Floyd happened. Um, and, and you and your husband were very um, involved and vocal uh, about when that happened and what was happening around in, in that community. And maybe you could share a little bit about the experience um, and what impact there was to your business. Yeah, absolutely. It was um, a very heartbreaking um, and hopeful time, I would say. There's, there's so many emotions that come just when I hear, you know, George Floyd's name or the third precinct or anything. But, you know, just to sort of walk through the timeline, um, it was Memorial Day weekend and my husband and I and our family have been going back and forth because I do work in California a little bit. I work in Minnesota a little bit. He works mostly in Minnesota. So we are always juggling schedules. And we had obviously, like many of you, woken up that morning and read about George Floyd's killing the day before and his murder. And, and we knew, like, as soon as we read it, you know, you could feel the heaviness come down. And as soon as we got to South Minneapolis, you could just, you could feel the, the grief, right? Um, the protest started that first day, I believe it was a Tuesday, if I'm remembering correctly. And, you know, we looked at uh, part of, well, part of how we've been getting through COVID as a business that had to shut down is by making hand sanitizer. So we had all this hand sanitizer. We, you know, we looked at the protests. We first had to take care of our staff and say, okay, you guys are grieving too. You feel this heaviness to so take the day. You want to go to the protest, go to the protest. If you need to go for a walk in the woods, go for a walk in the woods, like get your mental health. And if you want to go to the protests, if you would help us distribute hand sanitizer, that would be great because we're obviously still in a pandemic, right? So we were at uh, the, Nor the Nord tent and hand sanitizer and all the water we could get at Cup Foods and uh, brought it down there and thought, this is, this is how businesses can really play their part um, when something like this happens. You know, as, as we saw throughout multiple days, the protests themselves, though full of grief, were beautiful community-oriented, um, really phenomenal things coming together after a tragedy. But, uh, you know, as night started, some of the attitudes and behaviors shifted. I think some of the anger came. And, and I think there were outside influences that were not part of that protest. They weren't part of that peaceful protest that suddenly arrived. And we, we saw the escalation, obviously, day on day. And we had to think very uh, deliberately about what we wanted our reaction to be with that. We saw it getting closer and closer to the three, third precinct and the, sort of the epicenter of where things ended up. And we knew that we had two responsibilities. We had the responsibility as a business owner who um, 
could play a positive role. But we were also sitting on 2,000 gallons of high proof alcohol. And if that started on fire, we knew we would level a block. And I'm just being completely serious about it. So we had this public safety piece of this as well. And we strategized trying to move around product. We spent multiple days trying to figure out what's the safest way to store things. You know, if fires did spread, um, multiple times we went to the third precinct before it was um, inactive and told people, you know, like, if this starts on fire, do not go in there. Do not send firefighters into our building because they will not come out of there. And that was our one of our worst fears is that someone would start a fire and our building would go up and then other lives would be lost. Um, you know, to kind of sum up, I, you know, we had multiple days of this and we had to let go of the building and the stuff and just say stuff is stuff and stuff could be rebuilt. That's fine. If this is what creates change, awesome. Burn it down. If we can create change in a real way, then let's do it. However, we're not going to condone violence. And we also are going to make sure that people are safe. Um, and we're going to give our distillery in a lot of ways to the, to the hands and to the people of South Minneapolis and say, you know, there isn't, we're, we're not going to be there to protect it, but we need everyone to stay safe and to stay away if this happens. So we did receive damage in our warehouse facility. Um, what was interesting, was an interesting dynamic is our staff actually came back late one night when they saw the protest getting closer and they put up, um, you know, our business is a black owned business. My husband is black and um, he's the majority owner of our business. And uh, they put up black owned signs all around our cocktail room because our whole cocktail room is windows. And they did it out of the goodness of their hearts and they hoped maybe that would play a role. We weren't really sure. Um, and sure enough, the only area that we really sustained damage was in the warehouse facility, which had no windows <laughs> and didn't have any signage. And, you know, no one really knew what it was, but that's the area. And, and it was clear that the uh, damage that was done by arsonists, they were very professional about it. They knew exactly what they were doing. They found the high proof spirits that we found or that we had couldn't remove from there. And at the, um, uh, you know, in a split second, our sprinklers did come on after the fires were started and actually put out the fires that they tried to start with these large um, containers of high proof spirits. And so it was a very coordinated, very deliberate attempt um, to start a much larger fire. And, and instead we actually received, you know, the majority of our damage from their sprinkler system, which did indeed work wonders. So um, that sort of brings us to Friday morning, I suppose. And, and um, I, that was a lot. So I'll just probably take a pause from there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, you know, that um, that's the description of kind of how those days went. Um, it was an intense period here in South Minneapolis. I live and I'm about a mile and a half from the building. So I'm also just off of like East Lake Street, but closer yeah. to the river. And so this, um, it, we were, the, it was, there was a lot going on, grieving and um, people concerned about the violence and the damage to the businesses, which were mostly minority owned small businesses yes. across Lake Street. I think not everybody understood that. Um, and some were targeted and I think, some people like to say that you know like there's one narrative about what happened it was this and it was a lot of things um, there was a lot of things coming together in the confluence of that um, so you used your warehouse you said you gave your business to the community you used your warehouse as a donation center um, and, and then also created a, a, a riot recovery fund um, to support black and brown companies that were affected by the riot um, so you know Tell us a little bit about that experience of, you know, how did that come about? Um, and then with the recovery fund, I think you've done um, at least one round of, of granting kind of, so what was the response? How much did you raise? How many businesses have been supported? If you have, you know, fall parts, if you don't have exact numbers, it's okay. But just talk about some of that, you know, both the donation center and what you were doing and then the recovery fund. Yeah, so when the sun came up on Friday morning, we, um, opened up the distillery door and there was about two feet of water throughout everything. Um, and we still had a, had a structure, right? And that, and that was huge because we very quickly, I would say by the next morning realized that 
because of the damage and because of the infrastructure in that area really lends itself to be this really sustainable community, right? You have a lot of people who don't have cars, you have a lot of people relying on public transportation that wasn't running. And then you had this big shopping center to provide for these people. Well, all of that was gone. So we very quickly realized just with a couple conversations in the community that a number of families couldn't get formula for their kids, couldn't get diapers, you know, all those things that you buy every couple of days, milk. Um, and people also genuinely wanted to help. They said, how, how, what should I do? How can I help? So we coordinated with a couple of businesses across North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis and ourselves and started collecting donations. We were able to open up um, the distillery and move all the damaged equipment out um, because two feet of water doesn't really do much for bottling machines and stuff like that. So that was gone. But we were able to pull it out and dry the building enough to use it as a donation center because it was in walking distance for so many families that were in some of the um, higher density uh, population centers. And the neighborhood, I mean, we had people from, I would say, like the northern suburbs, people from out of state, like so many people hear about this and come and bring truckloads and truckloads of laundry detergent and, and everything you can think of. Um, and we just, you know, through the help of amazing volunteers, um, some of you may know the denizens through CERTS who also work on Mencia. They were instrumental in this. I cannot give them enough credit and just how they dropped everything and helped us organize this food pantry. Um, so Jessica and Dustin, if you're on or listening, I'm huge shout out to you guys and um, helped us clear the building and just get things organized. So, uh, you know, at its peak, we served about 400 families a day coming through who, who honestly needed diapers and baby formula and all of these things that we just take for granted being able to get. Um, so, we, so there's that piece. We also then realized that there is going to be a rush. I mean, it wasn't 24 hours and businesses around us were getting calls from developers saying, I'd like to buy your building. I can give you cash right now. And that, that neighborhood, as you hit on Diana, is this beautiful, multicultural, um, a lot of old family businesses, you know, that have been there for 40 years, serving amazing food and, you know, whatever it was. And Chris and I, my husband and I just all we had in, in our minds was sort of, you know, housing on top, retail on the bottom, super stale. And that's not what Lake Street was. And that's not what it was supposed to be. So we really made it our mission to say, okay, we have this one, we have an opportunity. A lot of people were looking at us and asking, what should we do? How can we help? And where can we give money? And, you know, we had insurance. We didn't need money. We had a structure. Um, but a lot of these businesses did. Um, you know, a, a number of businesses actually had removed their insurance as they were scaling back their expenses for COVID because they weren't open. So they removed their insurance policies as one way to get by, right? So we knew people were in a lurch. Um, so we started the Denard Foundation and at first we started it thinking, okay, you know, Chris was about to go on CNN, him and I did Fox News talking about this and we thought we need a way to channel some of this energy we're getting. We started the Denard Foundation hoping to raise, I think, originally $30,000, and we were like, oh my gosh, can you imagine if that happened? And we did it in almost a day, um, and so I just kept upping it and upping it and upping it, and I finally said, like, I think we have to go to a million dollars, and if we don't reach it, we don't reach it. I mean, that's okay, right? And we're just under $800,000 right now, and what we've been doing with the Denard Foundation is um taking applications very simple like we don't need anyone to fill out any more paperwork after filling out tons of insurance paperwork but we just need to know what is it for um you know how were you affected right and um you know what what type of business are you we really wanted to focus on black and brown businesses to get that diversity and that multiculturalism back into the community and make sure that those businesses were protected you know, black and brown businesses are typically undercapitalized extensively compared to white owned businesses. And uh, we wanted to focus on that segment of the population to ensure that everyone can rise and rebuild together. So now, yeah, we have the Denor Foundation. We have received requests for one little over $1.5 million in recovery funds. Um, we have just under 800,000 to spend. Um, and we're looking for creative ways to fundraise. We've had a number of people reach out um, and we're going to continue that over the next couple of years until we can um, know that businesses who were ready to 
rebuild are able to do that. That's so great. And I, I hear you. I, I, on Friday, um, I was able to help um, try to, with the food donations, and I took a, a carload of food from one food bank that was overwhelmed, had too much to bring it to another food bank, and I got to the other food bank in North Minneapolis, and they said, we're not taking any more donations anymore. I mean, the, to the, com the comment about how people, not just in South Minneapolis, but across the Twin Cities and across the state came in to, to do something. People wanted to do something. The outpouring was incredible, and um, thank you so much for you and Chris and your leadership and the denizens were helping me. I didn't know that. That's great. Of course, I know them. So, um, but you know that it, it's amazing. You know what can happen, and you know the money that was raised. Um, and we'll hear from Matt in a, in a few minutes here about Lake Street and what they raised. Um, you know, with their um, We Love Lake Street uh, campaign. So, um, we'll just quickly. Uh, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask about how the community can support you, and certainly, um, I think Dan put in the chat the the foundation. So, folks, if that you feel so compelled you can donate to there. But I guess I'll, the, the final question I'll throw at you is, so what next? What's the future? You know, um, yeah. where are you going and, and what are you doing? And is there a role for clean energy? Kind of t share a few minutes just on that. Yes. Um, so we have had the opportunity now to sort of relook at this. Um, like I said before, we uh, were tenants for a long time, and uh, we have the ability to now to really build the dream distillery, if you'd call it that. And, and I think our goal is to really put the stake in the ground and say, we are part of Lake Street. We're going to remain on Lake Street. Um, you know, people come asking us, oh, are you going to go somewhere else? No, we're going to be a neighbor of Lake Street. And... Uh, so we are looking at actually purchasing um, a building from another company that's there. Um, and the goal of this, we're actually going to overbuild. Um, and the goal is to create a business incubator space. So one of the, the problems that we're seeing is that black and brown owned businesses have difficulty being able to take their first step. So even if they get a little bit of capitalization, what's next? Are they able to actually have, you know, is it... Um, you know, the credit to get an actual brick and mortar? Is it the funding to, you know, um, do some networking? I mean, whatever it is, we want to provide those resources to make sure those businesses proper, uh, prosper. So we're overbuilding our space to create an additional kitchen and then also um, a couple of office spaces so that we can have sort of rotating small businesses come in and out and use it as a business incubator space along with Denord space. So that's one thing that we're doing and that's in the works. Uh, we're working with the city. Uh, they've been great partners trying to figure out exactly where, what is the best place to do this. So more on that soon. Um, and I would just say to everyone that the, the need, particularly for food, that is not gone. Um, you know, we do have some of the grocery stores coming back, but a number of the areas that were used as food banks had to close, including ours, because we, we just got to a point where we had to redo it. Mold was starting to set in, to be honest, and we had to start gutting it for safety reasons. We will be reopening that space as a food bank um, in the next month or two. And I, you know, a number of, you know, whether it was the churches, community centers, businesses that stepped up, a lot of them had to resume normal operations, but that doesn't mean that that need isn't there. So I would start looking for, you know, those areas in South Minneapolis that still are accepting donations because there are quite a few until the entire neighborhood can be as vibrant um, and as, you know, commercially centric as it was before. That's great. And that's, um, we'll, um, we'll dig out some um, links to share with folks in the follow-up um, for food banks if um, that's something they want to do it. Um, but, you know, it's really good to understand. I mean, some of these were businesses or community centers or whatever, you know, at the Ivy building, wherever, you know, that popped up, if you will, and couldn't continue to do that um, at, on an ongoing basis, but the need is still obviously really there. So um, thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Stand by. Um, I, you know, well, uh, we have a couple of questions, um, and um, I just see, you know, uh, I guess I'll let Dan hop in. Dan's been monitoring the question and answer. So, Dan, is there a question for Chanel? Yeah. Um, Gabe Epstein was wondering if there are any specifications or limitations on uh, what the Denord Foundation money can be used for by business owners. Um. So we are targeting minority owned and um, business owners and it can, it, gosh, it's been used for, so we've given money now to almost 50 businesses. 
Um, some have asked for window repair. Some have asked for, you know, specific equipment that was damaged. Um, we have provided all of that. Some, some just need a down payment on a new space. I mean, it, it's, there really isn't a lot of um, stipulation on what it can be used for. No, as long as it is, was related to the uprising and you're in the Lake Street or um, Broadway area, those were really the limitations. Oh, great. So you, you were not just focusing on Lake Street. You also um, extended that to the Broadway um, area, yeah. North Minneapolis. That's wonderful. Yeah. Great. We have from Clara yeah. Von Dolan. Um, what are you thinking for your space as far mm -hmm. as sustainability goes with your build? Um, thank you. I, I just realized before that I missed that. So thank you for asking. So we are looking at a very clean slate now, which is really exciting. So the building that we are looking at purchasing um, was half of it uh, was damaged and the other half wasn't. So we have uh, one area that we can completely re rebuild new and one area that we're going to have to renovate. Um, so we are looking to be LEED certified. We have already been talking about how we want to do solar, um, both for the water, because again, water use is just a big deal. And so we're trying to figure out how do we do solar with water, with distilling um, and hot water. And so that's a piece of it. Um, we're also looking at, we have a big parking lot if this deal goes through. And so we would be looking at doing possibly panels on the parking lot, but our need, you know, if you can imagine a distillery actually has a fairly high load. So it, again, if all goes well and our business keeps going, I would like to relook at some of the solar garden options as well um, as a more established business. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? We're, we're amazingly like, I think right on time, which I think I, I thought I was gonna blow it either in Never my talk me. or <laughs> asking you too many questions or commenting too much. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, uh, no other questions. So um, mm -hmm. I just um, thank you so much for at the last minute jumping in. Your story is amazing, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you're you're such a, a valued community member here. And I'm really really glad to hear that you're not going far away from Lake Street. I'm guessing Matt's super happy about that too. Um, and um, and for your you know how you. Um, how you showed up for the community in the days after, you know, even when your business was, you know, damaged. And again, you know, um, not from the fire, but from the water extinguisher. But, you know, thankfully, without the, the sprinkler system, you know, perhaps it would have been much worse, not just for your building, but the buildings around, as you said, you know, high powered spirits. I mean, that is fuel. Um, so fuel for the fire, literally. And um, so grateful to have you here. And um, thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone.